Hello, hello. And it has happened. The RP2350 has landed. And as followers of my account might know, I've been in the chip industry for quite some time. And so in the following steps, I'm going to look together with you a little bit at what the chip does and what we know about it now. Let us start out by comparing the two chips. The new one here, we see it now uses the M33 Cortex. So this means that an FPU is available, which can greatly accelerate some algorithms. And while with the RP2040, the Raspberry Pi Foundation was perfectly content to be the servant of ARM, here on the new one, we see that they are also providing a RISC-V hazard core, which they incidentally even call hazard, and which we're going to look at in more detail as the video proceeds. Then there is an optional version of the chip, which has two megabytes of flash on the die, so you don't need the external flash chip anymore, which was characteristic of previous designs. And finally, there is a larger housing option, and because a larger housing obviously provides for more pins, there's obviously more GPIOs also. And then finally, both of them still together have the attribute that there are no wireless options at all. So if you want to do anything wireless with a Raspberry Pi microcontroller, you need to drag in an external module such as the one from Infineon. to start with the most important thing first. The silicon of the new RP2350 is actually a chip which has four cores. But as you see here, there are two RISC-V and two ARM cores, and at any time only two can be active. So two ARM, two RISC, or one of each. And the interesting thing is here, this Hazard 3 chip. Because if we look here, we see that the Raspberry Pi organization had a guy, Mr. Luke, working on a three-stage RISC-V processor for quite some time. And yes, when you're talking about the RISC-V processor, it is always important to look at the feature sets offered because the feature sets tell you what the MCU can actually do. And yes, there is a video on this available here also. Either way, you see here that they've been giving the thing quite a bit of features, including integer multiplication and division. Basically, the only thing which the Cortex M33 can do, which the RISC-V thing cannot do, is floating point. And from my point of view, I've heard persistent rumors that this is a maneuver to force ARM to lower the royalties. I have heard that one Chinese company, I don't want to name drop them, in fact, the whole reason for the RISC-V business, when they started this, there was no Russia-Ukraine war. When they started it, there was only one motivation, and that was to force ARM to lower their royalties. And what makes this pretty interesting in terms of the design is here in the data sheet that we see that the processors basically always use the AHP and APB bus fabric. So apparently the bus system remains completely the same regardless whether the ARM or the RISC-V core is currently providing compute power to the application. If we scroll down in the specifications, we see here a claim of software compatibility. So this, similar to the Giga device GD32F103 situation, means that code can be recompiled. And unlike in the case of Giga device, in the case of the Raspberry Pi, it looks like a compilate intended for the old version absolutely will not run 
on the new version. But this is just nitpicking because in principle, as I already mentioned, it's always a good design practice to perform a recompile anyways. Given that in multiple places the team claims as much compatibility as possible, of course the question remains what will be the favorite real-time operating system. And the answer to this, as you can see here, in an interview with the register, is pretty clear that they will continue seeing free Artos as the preferred operating system. However, they are not completely unwilling to also engage with CFUR from the Linux Foundation. And what is notably absent from this interview, and what's interesting for me, is that they absolutely don't seem to care about what was formerly Azure Artos and what is now owned by the Eclipse Foundation. When it comes to the Raspberry Pi, or in general to microcontrollers, recently we've seen a race to reliability. And under this term, I would uh, like to subsume various movements intended to give designers the security that the part will not be discontinued over tomorrow in the morning. And in the case of the RP2350, we see here that they plan to keep it in production until 2040. This, of course, in a way is illusionary because nobody knows whether the Raspberry Pi will not just go bankrupt because the arrogant ones too often and Shen Tseng Sun Long wipes them from the plate. But in theory, it's January 2040 as the cutoff date. And yes, what makes this very, very funny is the inconsistency because now I've changed back into the product brief and we see that here they expect production until 2045. I mean, of course, it is legally more weasel worthy, but I think it's just a bit slimy. Why can't they just specify one date and stick to it? And if we go here, we can access the datasheet like so. And here we see the pinout of the various versions. We see there is a QFN60 here, which to me looks by and large similar to what they did on the predecessor chip. And then here we've got the new QFN 80 version, which of course, courtesy of the significantly larger housing, also has significantly more GPIOs, which used to be a problem on the RP2040 and also caused quite a bit of trouble on some ESP32 designs. And yes, here in the product brief, we have again the overview, which confirms especially the increased amount of peripheral devices. And yes, again, here we have the dual cores and everything, but this we already had before in the overview. Another interesting aspect is here the security features. This is the first time that in the Raspberry Pi field there is a security features in the datasheet. So apparently, in a way, the Uptonites were surprised that their microcontrollers were actually used so heavily in the commercial space. And in a way to satisfy these users, they now provided quite a bit of additional security features, which incidentally you got on microcontrollers from other companies such as SGS Thompson or Giga Device for a very, very long term. So of course, a lot of the media attention which they are getting is not really earned, but it's merely them catching up with the competition. And as for chip availability, I mean, it's the usual game. If I go here and do my usual OEM secret search, all which I find is a part by Glenair. So the Raspberry Pi microcontroller isn't even for sale yet. 
And here I've got the register your interest field. So if I want or if you want to, you can fill this out and then you can ask and hope that they get back in touch with you if you are politically correct enough and are in their good graces. So I probably will never get something. But, and this is something which is weird, I actually only found out about the availability of the new chip because Seed Studio sent me a link to this. And you see that they are providing an RP2350 based version of the Xiao board. And the cool thing about this is that it was possible to buy it online. And you see here, it is still in stock, but you can only buy one at a time. And I've of course already bought one and I paid for DHL shipping, so it should probably arrive pretty soon and then we will be able to talk more about it. And yes, of course, the Raspberry Pi Pico 2, as of now, is not available for ordering. One interesting thing is, I see here an external flash chip again. So apparently on the Pico 2, they will be using a non-internal flash version of the microcontroller. And yes, it's five dollars. And if we click here and we try, for example, Austria, we go here and we see it's not available. Next, we go closer to home of the Church of Upton. We go here, we go to P. Moroni and P. Hut. And we see that here they say it is expected to ship around the 19th of August and they say pre-order only. So in short, if you want to use the official Raspberry Pi Pico 2, the shippings will probably only start on the 19th of August. And yes, there is also another one which is able to be ordered immediately by a company called Cytron. And you see here, it is a motion controller board which is based on the 2350, but it is more of a robot board, so I don't think it is so well suited for evaluation. But you see, it's also available for ordering immediately. And another interesting alternative is by P. Moroni. You see here, if you look at the P. Moroni website, the PGA2350 is available already to purchase. This is something where I do think that the Uptonites actually deserve significant praise, which is why I'm going in front of the camera once again. I personally think it is entirely possible that they have been delaying intentionally the availability of their own board in order to give their design partners a free run at people like me or other industrial users who don't really care about the money so much. And so these guys can now rake in some of the cash and the average maker, as we call him in German, the Schlomo Normalmaker, he then goes and waits a few days and then buys this. Because if there would be available today the official evaluation board, people like me would never bother with these alternative products. And this, of course, I mean, respect where respect is due, honor where honor is due, and applause for the Uptonites. I mean, respect for this one. And with this, I have to thank you for listening. As always, of course, there is the famous quip, hindsight is 80-20. So this is made today on the 9th of August of this year. And this is what I know today. And of course, down here in the comments, if you want to leave a comment, I'm very thankful.